I'm delighted to be invited to speak to you here today about the, uh, the quality improvement program that we've initiated at Salisbury Hospital relating to oral health, which we've called the SMILE uh, Oral Care Pathway. Most of you will be aware of the concept of a quality improvement project, but you may be wondering why a consultant radiologist who admittedly know, knows nothing about or very little about oral, oral medicine or dentistry is presenting this to you today. So what I'd like to do, rather than give you the details of what we're doing, is to give you some of the background and the story behind why we've initiated this at this time. And it's all about this disease, which you've heard about already this morning. I'm an educator in the field of uh, medical imaging, and early in the pandemic, it became very clear to us that we were dealing with a very different type of pneumonia, something we'd never seen before. There are two aspects I'd, of the medical imaging, the radiology, that I'd like to highlight to you today relating to the, the lung disease. Firstly, the distribution of the lung disease, and secondly, the characteristics of that lung disease. And from these features, to draw some insight into how the disease develops in the lungs, and also how we might be able to help with disease management. So you can see from this image here that it's the, the bottom and the sides of the lungs that are affected with the shadowing symmetrically, and this is a highlighted image here. And this is what that shadowing looks like on a CT, again with a highlighted image. So you can see these areas of increased density, or what we call ground glass opacities at the lung bases. And this was thought in the early days to be a key feature of the lung disease, but actually ground glass uh, shadowing is a non-specific descriptive term we use in the context of describing many lung diseases. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the distribution of this disease. It's the back and the edges of the lungs that are dominantly affected. And you can see here that there are dilated blood vessels supplying those areas of abnormality. And in fact, it's these dilated blood vessels which are the, really the hallmark feature of COVID. Wherever we see this, these areas of lung damage, ground glass, opacification, or consolidation, we see these dilated blood vessels, and they're dilated arteries and veins. Much has been said about thrombosis or clotting in the lungs in the context of COVID-19. Broadly speaking, there are two types we see. There's macrothrombosis, which is evidenced by filling defects, which we see on a conventional CT pulmonary angiogram, which is the standard CT study we used to look for pulmonary embolus. But we also see evidence of microthrombosis, which are uh, represented by these areas of triangular ground glass change or wedge-shaped ground glass change in the lung peripheries, which we'd normally expect to see in pulmonary infarction, secondary to pulmonary, um, pulmonary thromboembolic disease. And what they really represent are areas of vascular congestion, second, secondary to loss of blood supply to those areas. And that's due to microscopic clotting in the context of COVID. In fact, all the features of COVID-19 lung disease are vascular. And it's crucial that we understand that the airways are not inflamed. Comparisons of CT scans between patients with COVID and those with influenza or other type, types of viral pneumonia show significant differences between the two diseases, specifically with a total lack of airways inflammation in COVID-19, with no bronchial wall thickening and no mucus plugging of those small airways. And studies which directly compare the radiology with the, the pre-mortem radiology CT scans with post-mortem autopsy studies tell the same story of vascular disease with microvascular damage being key drivers of disease. So the clotting in the lungs and all those vascular entities, we should really consider the disease itself rather than a complication of the disease, which is what I think many people have thought. With microscopic clots, 
forming in the small blood vessels of the lungs. So both the distribution and the characteristics of COVID-19 lung disease are vascular. We certainly shouldn't be calling it a, a conventional pneumonia, but rather I think the term a pulmonary vasculopathy is a better term, which means it's a disease of lung blood vessels. If that's what's going on in, in the lungs, what's the mechanism? And the question that struck me was, could the virus be arriving in the lungs via the bloodstream directly? And this led to publication of a hypothesis relating to the potential for an anat a direct anatomical pathway from the upper respiratory tract and the mouth via the blood to the lungs, and uh, ra rather than just being inhaled. And I made that available for discussion in early 2021. I then teamed up with uh, experts in the field of oral medicine, periodontology, to publish a formal scientific hypothesis. We explain that the mouth is a viral reservoir. It's like a viral factory churning out SARS-CoV-2 into saliva in very high quantity. And we describe a model of viral delivery via the blood, blood vessels to the lungs over the course of illness. Initially, I was just thinking in simple terms. If you have bleeding gums, as many people do, then the virus which is in very high number in saliva, could easily pass into the blood. There's no physical barrier. And from there, there's only one route the virus could take. It would pass down the jugular veins, converge in the superior vena cava in the chest, and pass through the right side of the heart. And the anatomy of the pulmonary arteries is important because the circulation in the lungs is under low pressure. The pulmonary artery first comes upwards and it then doubles back, it then divides into left and right and doubles back on themselves, pointing backwards, downwards and outwards into the gravity dependent parts of the lungs, exactly to where we see the greatest damage done with COVID-19 with those areas of ground glass change and dilated blood vessels I've shown you. Rewinding to how the virus gets into the body, we know that the nasal passages are the first site of infection where the ACE2 receptor is expressed in very high, uh, with very high intensity, between 200 and 700 times more intensely than in the lungs. And contrary to conventional disease modeling, the ACE2 receptor is not present in high number in the airways of the lower respiratory tract in the lungs. And some people say that it's not present at all. Even if it were present, we still need to explain why it's those parts of the lungs that are least accessible to an inhaled pathogen that are affected in the depth of the lungs. We know that cells which line the mouth are highly susceptible to infection and viral replication, especially in the minor salivary glands which are present over the surface of the tongue on the inner surface of the lips, the soft palate and the fauces. And from these cells, the virus enters into saliva in alarmingly high concentration, such that a single teaspoon of saliva will contain 500 million copies of the virus. That's half a billion in a single teaspoon. Importantly, Yale University, who've done a lot of work in analyzing saliva in the context of the pandemic, have reported that high viral load in saliva is a predictor of poor outcome. And they say it's an even better predictor of death than the patient's age. And here is the missing link between the mouth and the blood. It's gum disease. Importantly, a large study showed that in those with COVID-19 uh, who have dental x-ray evidence of long-term uh, bone loss because of periodontitis have a very high risk of poor outcome. Uh, that's intensive care admission or me mechanical vent ventilation with an odds ratio for death of 8.81. If the virus were to leak into, uh, from the saliva into the venous drainage of the mouth and get to the lungs in that way, on arrival in the blood vessels of the lungs, that would result in vasoconstriction 
and immunothrombosis through interaction with the ACE2 receptor, which is found on the inner surface of blood vessels or organs of the body, including the lungs. And the result would be vascular congestion, which is exactly the phenomenon we see visibly taking place radiologically in the lungs, causing those dilated blood vessels and ground glass opacities. It's striking that all of the risk factors for severe COVID are the same as for having gum disease. And in our, in our hypothesis, we present that gum disease is a converging risk factor and potentially even a main risk factor for developing the lung disease. I'm not talking about getting the disease, I'm talking about getting the lung disease. So the question, next question is, if this is what's going on in the mouth and the lungs, is there anything we can do about it? So I presented these ideas to my, ho uh, my hospital in Salisbury, and we decided that we would act. Initially, we started by just assessing and auditing our current practices in terms of our oral health um, of our patients. We found that many of our patients had uh, neglected mouths and severe gum disease. We found that 37% of our patients didn't have a toothbrush with them in hospital. And most of them didn't know that they could ask for one. So we quickly concluded that we had to do better. And we initiated this quality improvement project, which we called the SMILE Oral Care Pathways across the whole hospital. And this line sums up what we're doing. We're linking oral health to general health. And the project is based on existing evidence which says that paying attention to oral, oral health care in the hospital setting is uh, good for outcome, improves clinical outcome. And it's also based on a, an existing cost uh, benefit analysis which shows that investment in oral health care is hugely cost effective. We're writing up policy documents, uh, but we prioritized uh, the work for COVID patients, putting in specific uh, guidance and a patient information sheet, which we laminate and give to all of our COVID patients and have done for months. It includes a visual aid which uh, reminds people of how to care for their own mouths, assuming they're self-caring throughout the day. And the guidance is based on existing advice, uh, which already exists, of, of how we should care for our mouths. And we've made this available uh, publicly on our hospital website at that address there. The patient information sheet gives some background along the lines of what I've been explaining to you and explains uh, why we consider this guidance to be important. It explains what the guidance is. It's, it's very straightforward. It's just encouraging people to brush their teeth and to uh, care for their mouths, to care for their dentures, to keep the mouth clean if they have COVID-19. And we suggest use of a, a fluoride-based mouthwash for which there is already existing NHS guidance relevant to all of us all of the time. But as well as containing fluoride, the mouthwash that we offer our patients and prescribe to our patients uh, also contains an ingredient which has been shown to be virucidal. There's a growing evidence base for the efficacy of mouthwashes in the context of COVID-19, which have mainly been studied uh, to try and reduce transmission between patients and healthcare workers, mainly in the context of dental procedures. But there's also evidence of the use of mouthwash um, in, in the context of COVID-19 for reduction of symptoms without contraindication and with reduction of hospital stay reported of four days by, just in, by adding in a mouthwash as the single additional measure uh, in addition to standard care. We base the choice of our mouthwash on the excellent work of Cardiff University uh, and their in-depth work, which has just recently been published uh, formally. And they showed that specific mouthwashes, and it's, specific, it's only a few that do this, completely eradicated the virus in the test tube, in vitro, and also eliminate the virus from saliva in vivo in the mouth for a prolonged period of time. And at this stage, Cardiff University don't offer recommendations in the clinical setting based on uh, regarding the use of mouthwash. Um, this was a pragmatic decision that we took at Salisbury Hospital to uh, uh, 
in, that, in the context of that wider uh, oral, oral healthcare program, uh, based on the idea that the virus could be getting from the mouth to the lungs via the blood. But even if the route is incorrect, or uh, it doesn't really matter which way the mouth is getting to, uh, the saliva is getting to the, from the mouth or the upper respiratory tract to the lungs, um, bearing in mind that those associations between uh, high viral load in the mouth and poor outcome and gum disease and poor outcome. For me, I think the concept of pathogens escaping the mouth and passing into the bloodstream in this way highlights that this could be happening for many other diseases and helps us perhaps to understand the wealth of evidence there is now regarding the link between poor oral health status and systemic diseases and how they develop. There's now evidence that multiple systemic diseases of the body are in some way mediated by poor oral health, especially periodontal disease. By this I mean that gum disease causes these diseases or prolongs them or worsens them or worsens prognosis. I wonder if you've ever thought about what happens to food or a substance in your mouth, what, how it might get out of your mouth, what anatomical route it might take. Conventionally, if a substance is in your mouth, there are four routes it might take. That's, you can spit it out via the lips, or it can go backwards and upwards through the nasal pharynx into the nasal passages, or you can swallow, or you can inhale or aspirate into the trachea. But there is a route five out of the mouth and into your body, which is rather obvious, but it's a route that we don't usually consider pathogenic and that's the mucous membranes of the mouth, which are particularly vulnerable if you have poor oral health status, uh, if you have gum disease, uh, bleeding gums, mouth ulcers, and so on. We already know that this route could be at play in other diseases, for example, infective endocarditis, uh, which can be triggered by dental procedures, allowing bacteria to escape the mouth and pass to the inf and, and, and infect the heart valves in those who are susceptible. But in fact, any any pathogen, toxin, um, or inflammatory mediator, microorganism that could escape the mouth would first pass via the jugular veins through the superior vena cava and into the right side of the heart, and then into the lungs. And if the pathogen didn't interact with the lungs, as is proposed as the case for SARS-CoV-2 in the context of COVID, then that pathogen from the mouth could pass into the systemic circ circulation and end up in any target organ where it could trigger disease. And there's already good evidence that this anatomical pathway is exactly what's happening in many of those diseases. Researchers are now saying that cardiovascular disease is caused by microorganisms responsible for gum disease. In rheumatoid arthritis, the bacteria Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is the primary pathogen for gum disease, the DNA of that bacteria is found in the inflamed synovium of people with rheumatoid. And it's implicated in autoantibody production in rheumatoid. The same bacteria is found in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease and has been shown to play an important role in production of amyloid plaque, which is the known pathological cause of Alzheimer's. And the list goes on and on. There are huge economic implications for the prevalence of gum disease in the population. And this report highlights the staggering number of people with severe gum disease in the population and equally staggering predicted cost savings by investing in basic oral healthcare measures in the population. I think it's time for a new, powerful public health message. Gum disease kills. It's stark and simple, but it's true. It's true for COVID. It's true for multiple systemic diseases. Diseases which kill us. Diseases which cause debilitating symptoms and huge healthcare burdens. And the existing evidence makes this clear. And it has implications for all of us. Doctors need to be educated 
about the links between poor oral health status and development of systemic diseases. As it said in the world of medicine, we need to put the mouth back into the body. Hospitals need to invest in better oral health care uh, pathways. And we need to invest in the staff and the training required to do that. Dentists need to be frank with their patients. I've never been to the dentist and been told that if you don't look after your mouth and your gums, then that might determine which diseases you get, or how severely you get them, or how long you get them, or how long you live. And the public have a right to know the risks of not looking after the mouth. Politicians need to be made aware of the potential huge cost savings there are in investing, investing in public health measures which inform and empower patients or people to care preventatively for their mouths. And politicians also need to be made aware of the huge health disparities there are, perhaps the number one health disparity in this country relating to access to dental care. And for you as experts in infection prevention and control, you have a, a, a crucial role to play in insisting on good quality oral health care in every clinical setting. And it's great that you're now uh, embarking on projects relating to oral health and taking gum disease seriously, which is, is timely because just last year the WHO issued, or it, it challenged itself to issue an action plan relating to oral health care conditions which affect more than three and a half billion people. So in conclusion, I've demonstrated to you that COVID-19 lung disease is not a conventional pneumonia, but rather should be considered a pulmonary vasculopathy, a disease of the lung blood vessels. And, but, um, and that's throughout the, ho the, the, the whole course of disease. And, and that, by the way, includes long COVID because that's also, those people with long COVID with respiratory symptoms, they have radiological features which are also characterized by vascular damage to the lungs. I presented the case for a direct viral entry route from the lung, gums to the lungs via the bloodstream, and that highlights how oral health could be paramount to how we understand the disease pathogenesis, but also how we might be able to help with disease management. And there's evidence that control of viral load in the mouth uh, helps with uh, um, disease, uh, with lengths of stay in hospital. And I think that this is something that everybody should know. There's already clear evidence that the mouth acts as an inlet of the pathogen, of, for pathogens into the body, potentially explaining the causative connections between gum disease and systemic diseases. And we always need more research. But in the meantime, there are sensible, simple, and safe steps that we can take now to take, for, to take care for our mouths and the mouths of our patients, especially if you have COVID. Thank you very much. There's just some uh, additional references there for the recording um, and some additional resources for anyone who's interested in learning more. Thank you very much.